you. I've never given anything even closely resembling a sermon, so bear with me. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm a filmmaker, so I usually uh, typically will speak uh, either with my film uh, as a kind of Q&A type thing or um, in an artist talk type format. I've, I think I saw some of you yesterday at the Art Museum. Um, but this time I thought maybe I would not so much speak about my films, but more uh, what I've learned from a few decades of making films. Can, can you hear me okay? Is it? Okay, great. Um, so I grew up in Ohio, and ever since I was young, I've always enjoyed writing and uh, taking pictures and art projects and filmmaking. And for me, they've always been a way of discovering the world, of uh, getting out there and sort of an excuse to talk to people, to interview people, um, to follow my curiosity. Um, I, I really enjoy uh, meeting people from different cultures and uh, trying to become fluent in different languages to cross cultural boundaries and uh, hearing people's stories and also telling stories myself. Um, I've uh, traveled a lot and especially in my 20s after college I traveled a lot and I, I never really wanted to just be a tourist uh, going to all the tourist sites but I liked, I always worked, um, tried to support myself while I was traveling and to maybe be useful in some way or to at least learn as I was going so I could become a better person in some way. And um, so I would often, in the early days before I was making films, I would often be writing, you know, writing, publishing little articles here and there. And it was often an excuse to go to some really interesting place and an excuse to ask people if I could talk to them about the history of that place or um, something like that. So I, these, these types of travels took me to places like the silver mines of Potosi, Bolivia, where um, half of the silver from the New World was extracted uh, to Spain, uh, fueling the you know, Spanish Empire. And in the process, eight million people died in, those, in this single mine, um, mostly uh, indigenous people and people of African descent working in the mines. And I got to tour the mines with a, you know, a miner who works in the mines and go you know, thousands of meters underground when you're already at this high elevation. So you know, things like that, or things like visiting my, the house that my grandfather grew up in in China, which, um, well, the house wasn't there, but the property, the house he grew up in was built 500 years earlier by his ancestor, um, and, you know, the tiles are oriented diagonally because this was a, a, a government minister, so only the government ministers could orient the tiles diagonally in their houses, and everyone else had to make them right angle. Um, and my travels also took me to the killing fields of Cambodia, um, where I was shooting a part of my second film and um, to a site that uh, was originally a school building and then it became a prison and torture facility for uh, opponents of the um, Khmer Rouge and then it became a museum and they have the skulls stacked up many stories high of people who had died in, those, in that place. Um, so I was always out looking for stories um, to uh, not obviously not just to entertain people, but to somehow enlighten people. Um, and I've ended up making several films, as I talked about yesterday for those of you who were there. I've made several films that generally are about um, cultural hybridity and, and the ways in which people are able to borrow cultural traditions from uh, another, sometimes another culture and reapply them in another context to try to address social issues and try to improve the situation by learning from other other. Uh, cultures. Um, so um, I studied filmmaking um, in college and English, uh, so sort of writing and filmmaking. And after graduating, I you know, set out to try to become a filmmaker. It's not an obvious career path, but I did start with like an obvious thing, which was an internship at my local public television station, WGBH. And they're a big one. They produce like, you know, I think 70% of the content for primetime public television, which Back in that day, people still watched television, so it was a it was a big deal. And you know, I sort of started working my way up that totem pole, and I thought that maybe that was how I would become a filmmaker. You know, if I start as an intern, and then I became you know become a production assistant and associate producer, and then you're a producer. And um, I sort of got a little bit up that the beginnings of that totem pole, and then um, I decided you know I got, my travel itch got to me, so I took off to to make films. And when I returned, I decided that I didn't want to necessarily work in that structure, so I. Um, set off to make my first film of my own that was not, you know, uh, part of a television production, but just an independent film, and that was one about my family in China, my mom's family in China. And, you know, that film kind of got me started, and it, it got on the television station, um, and it was, 
enough to help me get some funding for my second project, which was in, Cam in the Cambodian American community. Um, and that one, you know, showed at some festivals, uh, showed in, on television, and you know, I was very happy with how it was going, but at the same time, I was sort of never able to get my films into these A-list film festivals, you know, Sundance and Toronto and, and Berlin, um, and in some ways not even a B-list festival for a while. It was just, I was watching all of my, uh, my colleagues were sort of making these big festival circuits and stuff, and somehow I was going on these little trips here and there, and I couldn't quite figure out, like, what was their secret, and, what, you know, I looked at their films, I looked at my films, and I, I couldn't quite um, figure out uh, why I didn't feel like I was meeting some mark that was set for me. Um, so, but I kept on doing it anyway, because it was, it was fun, it felt, you know, it felt like the thing to do. So, um, I, I was making my own films, which generally take about five years for me to make, uh, partly because it's a kind of a secondary enterprise. And my main bread and butter was, um, for about 20 years, making videos for nonprofit organizations. So on commission, I would be hired to make a, you know, a short video of a, a minute or five minutes or a longer piece of 20 minutes to help some social cause. Um, so I made probably over 100 of these videos. Um, most of them were for um, community health or education purposes. and. Um, it was nice because I always felt like I was helping some something I believed in, um, uh, and it was uh, getting me out. You know, I was telling stories and I was getting out into the world, meeting people, learning about other uh, people's situation, and trying to help these organizations make some change in the world. And also, it kind of helped subsidize my own art projects because I had the equipment and I had you know people helping me, so I developed a little infrastructure for that. Um, and then I um, was also teaching part-time. I was an adjunct, um, and that I did mostly because of the community. It was very nice to be part of a university, and you know, anyone who's ever taught adjunct, the pay isn't that amazing, but the belonging to a community and not just being a freelancer was a really good thing for me. Um, so I continued making my own films as well, but by the third one, I started to feel like, you know, it was sort of fun to make these films, but it was so hard to get funding. There was almost no funding, and distribution was sometimes hard too. And so I started to think, you know, why, why should, should I continue doing this? Like, you know, the, the freelancing stuff was going kind of fine, and the teaching is fine, and this other, but this other thing, which I considered kind of my passion and my big thing, was in a way kind of dragging me down because it wasn't bringing in income. It takes a lot of time, and... So you kind of question, like, why am I doing this, right? That nobody's listening sometimes, and why, why do this? Um, and then I s started a 10-year journey to make my most recent film, which is called Circle Up. This is the one we're going to show a short clip of after this. Um, it took about 10 years from the beginning and to the end to make this film, and this was a journey that um, you know, resulted in a film, but it was also a huge uh, learning and growth experience for me. Um, kind of changed the way that I looked at the world, and it uh, also changed the way I looked at my own career. Um, and it was a circle up as a restorative justice film. So, you know, when you make these films, you start out and you don't know much about the subject, and you get kind of drawn in, and by the end of it, you're like a mini, mini expert on the subject. Uh, and um, I had not, I'm not sure I, I had even heard of restorative justice at the beginning of that 10 years. Um, but I heard about peacemaking circles. And um, this is a, a form of restorative justice that um, comes out of Native American practices and also exists in Maori practices and in um, some traditional African cultures. And it's a, a, a tradition where people build community and, and resolve conflicts by sitting in a circle and sort of putting everybody on the same footing. I'm sure some of you have participated in something like this where um, you're all facing each other and you pass a talking piece around that has some personal meaning, and it goes in a certain direction. And you can only speak when you have the talking piece, and otherwise you're invited to listen. And you can't speak again until you've listened to everybody else, um, full circle. Um, and the idea of a peacemaking circle is that it, it not only puts everyone on an equal footing, but it also encourages people to share their own stories of what they have in common, just to establish sort of values of what makes us all human, what are things that we all share for quite a long time before you actually ever get to talking about what the conflict is, if there's a problem to solve. And it's a very different approach than a Western, typical Western model where like, we have a problem, you know, what's the problem? 
you know, how do we solve it? That's kind of, it sort of jumps to, you know, we're here, there's a problem, we're going to try to solve it. And restorative justice sort of backs up and says, you know, who are we? And what, what were you doing at the, at the moment this, that, that sort of who are we? What, you know, how did we, we grow up? What are our values? What were we doing at the, the time that this incident or whatever happened? What, what were we thinking and feeling in that moment? What was everybody thinking and feeling at that moment, you know? And eventually you come around to what needs to be done to make things right. But it's like far into it. And by the time you get to that part in the process, the, the so-called problem has usually shrunk in proportion and the things that you have in common are, are great and the values in common. So, so I heard about these peacemaking circles that, you know, as an indigenous tradition that was being used in urban, among like young people dealing with gang um, violence and a way of bringing people together and sort of seeing their common humanity and um, as someone who's interested in these cultural practices that uh, kind of sparked my interest. So, you know, several years of research, traveling all over the country, trying to like find a good specific story to tell around peacemaking circles. I eventually met uh, Janet Connors, who is an Irish American woman from Dorchester, Massachusetts, Irish, um, sorry, a Boston, a neighborhood of Boston. And um, Janet's son uh, was murdered uh, actually 19 years ago um, on January 31st. And um, she's a person who, who grew up, uh, you know, she was always sort of connected to her community, I guess you could say. And the first thing she thought of when her son was murdered, he was, it was a, a home invasion. And, you know, it turns out her son and her, his roommates had been dealing drugs and it was kind of a drug robbery gone, gone bad. Not, not a murder that had been necessarily premeditated, but a bunch of 19 and 20 year old guys, a bunch of drugs, a bunch of weapons, a bunch of money, and a bunch of like, all of a sudden someone's dead. Like that, that was kind of the basic situation. And um, when things like that happen, uh, you know, there's often a great feeling of revenge that the families and friends of this group of people feel that they want to extract on the other group of people. And that was definitely the case um, in, with Joel, the young man. Um, so the first thing that Janet did as a community person was she got this impulse to call everyone into her back, all the people, all the, you know, friends of Joel and family and neighbors and call the people into her backyard into a big circle. And she didn't know about restorative justice that much, but she kind of had this sense, I'm going to get everyone into a circle. And this was like days, that, like in the day or two after he was murdered. And like 70 people crammed into their backyard. They had to go borrow chairs and people sat on the ground. And she basically went around and then she implored people, please, you know, nobody commit any violence in Joel's name. I don't want anybody hurt in his name. Can you please all just promise me that? Let's stop this here. And um, so that was the first thing. And that was very, um, it was effective, like that people, you know, took their pain and kind of held it in. Um, and then there proceeded to be the court case. Actually, there were four men responsible for the murder. So there were, um, I think, th three of them pled. So there was only one court case, um, which was actually, um, the guy who, the main person responsible, the one who had an 18 inch sword, basically. It was a huge, and he's the one who stabbed Joel in the heart. So like the other people were sort of responsible, but this guy really is the one who dealt the fatal blow. And in, the, in that court case, Janet, you know, the way Western court cases sometimes work is the, the victim is sort of just a witness, not a witness, but the victim is just like off on the sidelines of the court case, right? Court cases are not often about the needs of the victim. They're really about the, the, the state, you know, the perpetrator, the defense attorney, and the state. It's kind of a, you know, a very official theater <laughs> show is how she put it, you know, where in which, you know, she was like a bystander and, and they proceeded, you know, the defense attorney proceeded to paint this picture of her son, uh, the, you know, kind of, he had it coming to him, you know, he was, dealing drugs, and that's what you get when you live that life. You live by the sword, you die by the sword, and, um, and all these things, and, you know, some of which were not even true, and even if they were true, I mean, does that mean you deserve to die if you made, you know, some mistakes when you were young? And, um, and, and then um, the main perpetrator proceeded to get off. He, he was n not guilty because of various, you know, a very good attorney who basically created reasonable doubt. Everybody knows he did it, he knows he did it, the comedian, everybody knew he did it, but the defense attorney was able to create reasonable doubt, and so he got off free, he walked free, and he proceeded in the intervening years to brag about it, to commit more violence, to go in and out of prison, um, to threaten people saying, I've killed before, I'll kill again, you know, this kind of thing. Um, so this was like extremely dissatisfying, to, to say the least, for Janet to feel, to go to court and have you know, no justice in her mind, uh, no real justice. Not just because he wasn't punished, but the whole thing just left this terrible taste in her mouth. 
Um, so she began this process to try to meet the other three uh, men responsible for the murder who were all in prison, eight to 10 years, and one got 18 years. Um, again, not because he was more responsible. He happened to get 18 years because of uh, procedural types of things. Um, I guess he refused to, te to testify or whatever, you know. But um, so Janet wanted to meet these men, but you're not allowed to. Like the way Massachusetts law worked at the time, you weren't allowed to meet that these, you know, she wasn't allowed to request to meet them. So she uh, spent two years petitioning the, um, the Department of Corrections to have the first victim offender dialogue in Massachusetts. That's an official thing called a VOD, victim offender dialogue. And it took a year to convince them because you know the Department of Corrections didn't want to do this. They're worried about getting a bad reputation. They're worried about being too whatever. They're just worried about a lot of things. So um, finally, it got approved, and she had a, a, a very experienced mediator facilitator to lead. And it's not just like you go and you meet them. It's a it's a year long process where this facilitator meets individually with with each party for a year, every month for a year, to prepare them for a very meaningful meeting. And so he met with. Um, two of the men who agreed to this, he met with them once a month to prepare them. What did they want to say to Janet? What were their questions? What, were the, what was the things they wanted to say? And then he met with Janet. You know, what are you looking to get out of this meeting and what do you want to do? And um, so she met um, both of the, separately, the men two times in prison. And one in particular, I know she, because she, I know him quite well, he was in my film, and she met him once and the first time uh, she brought all these pictures of Joel from the time he was a baby all the way up, you know, through his childhood and and till the the last picture she had of him. And she, you know, she basically just wanted to show um, AJ. That's his pseudonym in the film. She wanted to show him, you know, what what was the life he had taken? Who was this person who he didn't even know who he had kill, helped kill? And um, she showed all these pictures, and he was not in a place to really take this in. He he says he remembers all these pictures and he remembers her sitting there and he remembers silence and then he got out of there and he said, whew, that's over, <laughs> I've done that, you know, and it just didn't really phase him. He proceeded to get into all kinds of trouble and, you know, get high on his birthday and get locked into solitary confinement in and out, you know, many times. And um, it wasn't until several years later that he was in solitary confinement, again, for doing whatever wrong in prison, he pulled out the transcripts from their meeting and because I guess they wrote everything down and he just started reading through them again. And he said it suddenly hit him like this light bulb, like, oh my gosh, I understand now why this woman came to me and um, why she wanted to meet with me and that she's like given me a chance. Like what an incredible opportunity that this woman, and she told him at that time, I will offer you a little piece of my forgiveness and if you can do a few things for me, I will give you the rest of my forgiveness. You have to earn it. And so he wrote her this big letter back saying that I understand why you came and um, I, I'm going to try to earn your forgiveness, forgiveness bit by bit. Um, and they eventually met another time and they've met many times and he has stood on his grave to, uh, to apologize to her and, and he's uh, committed to you know, lead his life in a good way and to also help prevent other violence in the community. Um, so, and in fact, he, he lives a few blocks from me, and he's married and has two kids and has a full-time job, and you know, he's completely turned his life around, and he says that he's really quite sure that if it hadn't been for Janet, he would be either dead or still in prison. Um, so, and I know that you know, um, this is true of the other man, although I have to say he's now back in prison. That's not as happy a story. But, um, so I end up making um, a film about Janet's story and also about Clarissa Turner, who's another mother I met um, who is an African-American woman who, um, her son was on his way, he's, you know, they were living in uh, Dorchester, and then he was on his way to in another part of Boston, quite other side of Boston, Charlestown. He was there just walking down the street to go visit his uh, girlfriend and kids, two kids, and somebody came up and just shot him point blank in the back of his head, thinking that he was like, as it was another drug-related thing, someone thought he was there to deal drugs, which he wasn't, but, um, so she's somebody who, uh, found herself, uh, you know, she's a very uh, spiritual, religious person, and she found herself in court kind of rising. She said, felt driven by a higher power, basically rising up and standing and facing the, the young men who were on trial and just staring them in the eye and say, I forgive you, you know, I forgive you, I forgive you, and just, um, she wasn't planning on doing it, and she said she felt this immense burden being lifted from her when she did that. Um, so both Jen and Clarissa do a lot of work in the community um, to help prevent, I mean, this is kind of their life's work. They help prevent violence by talking to young people, to anybody, but especially young people, 
about the choices they make. Um, and what, just working with them, I, I think it, it was an amazing experience for me to, first of all, to learn about a kind of justice that is a different concept than, you know, when we use the word justice, it's often associated with the justice system, the criminal justice system. And for me to learn about a type of justice that has nothing to do with legal justice, has nothing to do with revenge, nothing to do with punishment, that it's, it's really about, um, you know, looking at the needs of the person who was harmed and looking at the needs of the community and even looking at the needs of the person who did the harm. And just looking at that big picture, looking at the interconnectedness of things and um, trying to, I guess, to look at people's basic humanity and to connect with that in order to um, try to make things right again, as, I guess as Howard Zara says. Um, so um, for, I know for Janet, she often talks about justice being um, a balance of forgiveness and accountability. That it's not just about some person who's got, like she never wants to be seen as like an angel with a big heart who had it in her to forgive these guys, but, but rather that she was offering them forgiveness only in exchange for them holding themselves accountable. She was gonna hold them accountable and they were gonna hold themselves accountable. They were gonna take responsibility for what they did and take responsibility to uh, make things right in whatever way they could. You know, obviously they can't bring um, these people back, but they can try to do what they can to um, address, you know, make things better. Um, so, um, you know, this, uh, this film, you know, taught me a lot of things about um, restorative justice. I also learned about restorative filmmaking, I guess is what I like to call it, which is, you know, a way of making films that is really, you know, working with people to um, make sure that you are helping them in the process, I guess. And in this case, working with people who had suffered trauma, which I had never done before, um, meant that I had to very, be very attentive to what it meant to be filming this, to make them retell these terrible stories, to make them rewatch cuts of the film in order to give me feedback. And um, there were very particular things. I would never involved anybody so much in the making of a film, uh, you know, the participants of the film. And we had very detailed discussions, for example, about how many times was it okay for me, for the film to show Janet hugging the man who killed her son. Like, you know, I had filmed many examples of her hugging. She's a big, huggy woman, and, you know, she hugs him whenever she sees him. But um, in the discussions with her and her daughter, we agreed. They, they requested, especially the daughter, that I put in one hug in the whole film, no other hugs. And that might seem kind of strange, but I came to understand that for them, you know, her hugging him, it makes it seem like, oh, it's all okay. And it's, it's this balance between forgiveness and accountability that they wanted to make the point that, it's not just this like ever pouring gesture of forgiveness, but that it comes, it's balanced by what he's doing in return and that it's not, it's not all okay. Like when he says, I'm sorry, she doesn't say, that's okay. She says, I know, I know you're sorry. And that, that's it, you know, it's not that it's okay. It's not okay to murder somebody obviously, but um, so, so they, you know, they had this idea of like how much it was okay to show, how much is it okay for the film to show these bloody pictures of their, loved ones remains, you know? It was important, I asked them, is this okay? Is it okay to have, at one point murder was in the title. I said, is it okay to have murder in the title or does that offend you? And, and as Joel's sister said, well, they didn't die by cancer. <laughs> so, you know, say it like it is. So, um, but, and they were okay with having these bloody pictures, but just once, maybe twice, no more. You know, seven seconds, not nine seconds. Like, it's interesting, but, um, so I learned about what it means to be restorative as a filmmaker and to try to be restorative in everything that I do. Um, so I've also just had this whole journey with the film and distribution that, you know, it did show on public television and showed it again in a few film festivals. Um, no Sundance, no, you know, big ones. But this time with this film, I did something different and I joined a social justice filmmaking co-op. Um, it's called New Day Films. And it's, I basically found my people. These are all like 100 filmmakers around the country who make films that are trying to further social justice. And you know, all of us love to get our films in film festivals. I'll never say no if someone's gonna give me a little laurel or whatever, but all of us are also working to get our films out into places like churches and synagogues and prisons. This film has shown in many prisons, Janet and Clarissa are like rock stars in prison now because they get public television, they don't get a lot of cable channels and crime, crime stories are really popular in prison. So, Janet and Clarissa walk into prison and everyone yells, oh, Janet, Clarissa, you know, they don't even know them, but they're like stars. Um, it shows in legislator, legislatures, um, probation programs, schools. Um, so it's uh, actually really, I've, I've 
seen it making change in the world. I've seen it preventing violence. I know of a couple of cases where the film and the conversations around the film actually help prevent specific acts of violence. Um, and I've found that um, this actually is the most meaningful work I've ever done and that, that there's no film festival screening that would ever give me that. No film festival could ever, I mean, not never, but unlikely would a film festival ever result in somebody not being murdered who would have been murdered that night. And I can say that about this, this film. And um, so, um, so I guess the bigger picture thing that I've learned from all this is this idea of um, defining your own success rather than letting other people define it for you. And I think that for the first, you know, many, like 20 years of my career, I think I was trying very hard to meet this goal of like everyone else seemed to be doing these things that were prestigious and, you know, that's not like they, you know, made a lot of money from it or um, changed the world from it, but somehow that was the thing I was aspiring to, to, to um, get a certain kind of recognition. And I think I've learned that, um, you know, that I have to just look inside myself, why am I doing this and what is actually meaningful to me? And um, somebody said to me also this idea that you kind of go where it's open, like go where the opportunities are presenting your, themselves instead of the one, the door that you're banging your head against that won't open. Um, so I guess this is not the, in a way it's not a super original revelation because I know it's a kind of common middle-aged revelation that like you stop worrying about what other people think, but um, I think it does apply to other people, this idea of defining your success the way, what's important to you and just realizing that um, it is possible to make your own little bit of change in the world and um, so that's what brings me here to a non-traditional film venue, but I'm really excited to talk with you all afterwards and connect and keep on learning. So thank you for having me.